Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I recognize a huge number of names in this, uh, in this meeting. So thank you very much for attending. I'm sure this is going to be a very interesting talk. Uh, Tanya Marshall has a PhD from the Vitz University done in 1990, but she's been continuously involved in the alluvial diamond and precious stone industry since 1895, 1985, sorry. In 1996, uh, Tanya founded Explorations Unlimited and has been consulting and connecting, contracting to numerous South African and international exploration and mining companies and continues to write and do lecture on the subject of alluvial diamond deposition. Um, exploration, evaluation, and valuation. And, and she's also um, very involved in, in professionalism in the geosciences and engineering fields of practice. Tanya is a fellow of the Geological Society. She's a member of the Southern African Institute of Mining and Metallurgy, a life member of the Geological Society of Africa, and is registered with, a, with SACNASP and has been for some time. She is an active member of both the SAMREC and SAMVOL committee, chairs the SAMREC, SAMREC Diamond Working Group, and is the current chairperson of the SAM Code Standards Committee, as well as being the Vice President of Professional Affairs in the GSSA. And Tanya, with that, um, I think you can take it away. I'm looking forward to a great talk. I'm sure it will be. Thank you very much, Craig. Just to confirm, everybody can see my screen and I'm audible. I assume that's a yes. Okay, so before we go on, I would like to acknowledge my co-authors on this presentation, Mike DeVitt and John Ward, and also the contribution of many other geologists who've given me photographs and data from both current and previous operations. And now I'm going to stop my video and we can move directly in. In Africa, we find alluvial deposits of all ages in the geological calendar, right from the Archean all the way up to developing today. And as we can see from this diagram, we've got one here in the, the Archean, a few scattered about in the Proterozoic, and by far the greater majority are in the, the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic. And the, the jury is still out as to whether that has to do with the conditions of formation or simply preservation issues. We also find them in a number of different depositional environments, right from adjacent to and overlying primary deposits, all the way to the marine environment and pretty much everything in between. And in this travelogue, we'll have a look at some examples of all of these kinds of deposits. In Lesotho, Angola, Botswana, Tanzania, and Ivory Coast specifically, we all have, we have alluvial trains leading right from the pipe itself downstream to various distances. And one of the questions that people always ask is how far down the river do the diamonds have to travel before the values increase from industrial to gem quality? This work here done by John Ward a couple of years ago looks at the diamond values within one kilometer of the Let's Sing pipe in the Sutu. And what's obvious here is even within this short distance, we can see that there has been an upgrading of the, the value of diamonds in all sizes. This thing here around three carats appears to have been a glitch in the, the sampling. But it's this upgrading of diamonds in the alluvial system that makes them particularly at attractive to, to miners. So we start up at the, the Segela Kimberlites in the Cote d'Ivoire. And what we're looking at is a very simple system where we have got Kimberlites, um, terrace gravels, and floodplain deposits. Up here, we've got the that. Here we can see the Tubabuco by pipe, and this is the alluvial deposit sitting directly on top of the, the kimberlite. And somewhat downslope, we've got a number of, of terrace deposits. And then further down in the floodplain, we have the, the proper alluvial deposits themselves. Now, diamonds have been known from the Cote d'Ivoire since the early 
20s. It was prospected properly by the French and Belgian companies around about 1940s or so. And then they were mined commercially by the State Diamond Company in association with West African Selection Trust and Harry Winston back in the 60s. We've had civil unrest, military coups, diamond embargoes in Cote d'Ivoire since the late 70s, and production has been very erratic since then. And it's only been since, nine, since 2014, when the, the last embargo was lifted, that production has been able to begin again. And since then, it has been purely artis artisanal. And around about 2014, there were some 10,000 legal and illegal um, artisanal miners. We're looking at very small diamonds, as you can see here, about 0.3 carats per stone on average. The largest stone found to date is only a 27 character. Then if we move to the, the DRC around Bujimai, we see that directly around the, the Bujimai Kimberlites, the material has just simply been dumped into these caustic caverns and then reworked somewhat downstream into the, the Sankuru River. If we have a look at the, the diamonds that come out of the, the dumped alluvial material, we can see that there has been no upgrading from the pipes into this dumped material. But by the time it's moved somewhat downstream into the, the Sankuru River, we are seeing some rounding of the diamonds upgrading even in such a, a short distance. Moving on to Tanzania, here we see how the, the level of erosion of the Kimberlite pipe combines with the, the nature of the drainage to influence how the alluvial deposits develop. We've got limited erosion of the Madui pipe at Williamson Mine, and we can see that by the, the thick epiclastic sediments that have developed on the, on the pipe itself. The drainage in the area is very unimpressive with almost no incision, no down cuttings, what we call a passive drainage system. And we've got very limited development of gravels in the, in the rivers. Diamonds in the alluvial deposits around Wadui have been mined from the, the alluvial deposits which sit directly on top of the epiclastics and also some alluvials just off the, the pipe itself. There have been a few diamonds picked up in rivers emanating from the pipe, but nothing commercial has yet been located. And given the, the geomorphology in the area, it's highly unlikely that we we're going to find anything commercial there. Moving on to Angola, the Cretaceous Age Colonda formation is pretty much coeval with the emplacement of the Kimberlites. Now the Kalanta environment was not really conducive to a huge amount of, of erosion. So the highest diamond concentration occurs in halos around the Kimberlite pipe itself. And it's only when these deposits are incised by the, the energetic younger quaternary streams that we can get significant upgrading associated with the present river systems. The next environment we're going to have a look at is the inter or intercratonic basins. Now in its very simplest form, the diamonds drain off the craton, either from primary sources or pre-existing alluvial deposits, and they get into the inter or intercratonic setting to form terminal places. And here they can be reworked by various marine processes, such as wave action and longshore drift. The Witz Basin represents the oldest known alluvial diamond repository. And these have been recovered from the, the upper Witz conglomerates. And we're looking at, at several hundred carats. And the ones best known are from the conglomerates of the East Rand and also the Clarksdorf area. 
Some 194 carats were recovered from the Modavi gold mine. We also know of one or two diamonds from the, the cook shaft on the West Rand. So it looks as if it could be more widely spread throughout the, the Witz Basin, but they're not recovered today, obviously, because of the, the processes that, that uh, take place. Now, when we have a look at these diamonds, they are small stones. The largest stone was only a 10 carat. But they are, are green in color, almost black spots, which is the result of natural radiation within the, the Witz conglomerates. Back in the, the Cote d'Ivoire, in the area around Tortilla, we also find diamonds coming from the conglomerates associated with the, the basal formations of the Barimian sequence ancient beach places, as we can see here. And again, these are reworked into the, into the present river systems. Again, the diamonds are small. We've got the green coloration and the uranium pigmentation spots. And the current thoughts with respect to primary source is not necessarily kimberlite, but probably graphite or actinolite schists. In Ghana, again, we have diamonds being recovered as a byproduct from the, the Tarqua gold places. Yet again, the diamonds are eroded out of the, the base of conglomerates and into the, the present river systems. And as we can see, there have been over 10 million carats recovered from this area. And again, the diamonds are small, low quality, those green black colors, and again, potentially derived from graphite or actinolite schists. The Tardeni Basin in North Africa covers parts of Mauritania, Mali, and southern Algeria. Throughout the entire basin, we find large numbers of small diamonds and also G10 garnets at various localities. And the current working model is that the diamonds were originally deposited in the, the basal Tardeni, and these may or may not be associated with the group of barren to low-grade kimberlites found in Mauritania. The diamonds appear to have been weathered out and accumulated on the exposed deflation surface, and then the whole lot was covered over by the Sahara Sand Sea. Merengue in Zimbabwe. Geologically, what we're looking at here are the sediments of the Mkondo Basin at the edge of the Zimbabwe Craton. And the diamonds form, or, or the diamonds occur rather, at the base of an alternating siliciclastic and carbonate sequence. On the, the edge of the basin, we've got these six thick conglomerates with grades of 2,000 to 8,000 carats a hundred ton, phenomenal grades. This unit then thins in towards the, the basin until we're left with only a thin grit layer, and the grades here are significantly lower. Now, one of the defining features of the Merengue deposits are these very large, rounded, low-quality diamonds. But make no mistake, there are a goodly number of gem quality diamonds in the mix as well. The Merengue deposit has been interpreted as a proximal terminal placer on the edge of the, the craton. And you've probably had repeated and long lived tidal working, reworking in a shallow depression, which has upgraded the diamond concentration. Over 100 million carats have been recovered from the Merengue deposits, and it is regarded as one of the world's two mega terminal places. The other one is Namibia. Again, diamonds were deposited as beach deposits of various ages. Some of them on land, some of them are submerged, and even as far out as the, the continental shelf. And here we can see some examples of the, the trap sites in which the, the diamonds are, or from which the diamonds are recovered. 
The major difference between the Namibian terminal plaza and Marangi, they both have recovered over 100 million carats. Marangi has approximately 10% gem quality, while Namibia is over 95% gem quality. And this is possibly related to the energy of the Atlantic Ocean. We will talk about another deposit that has produced 100 million carats somewhat later down the line. The third major depositional environment that we'll look at today is the, the normal fluvial alluvial system, both meandering and braided river systems and all of their associated geological settings. The principal geological settings for river deposits are shown here. Up here we have the, the colluvial gravels. These are typically located on the, the outer flanks of the valleys. They form from the deflation of pre-existing terrace deposits, which typically makes the, the grade somewhat higher and is also easier for the artisanals to exploit because there's not so much overburden. When we look at the, the, the terrace deposits, we can have any number of flights of terraces, right from the outer margins of the floodplains all the way down to the, the current river flats. And typically we have a basal gravel, which is the diamondiferous one, which is overlain by finer grained fluvial units. In various situations, both the overburden and the gravel can be semi-consolidated. You can see here, we've got laterized uh, deposits. We can also get calcritization depending upon the prevailing climate. Then we move on to the, the river flats. Here we've got variable overburden thicknesses, unconsolidated gravels, but they form typically a primary exploration target, mostly because there's significant volume often associated with reasonable grades and relative ease of mining. Then we move on to the, the present river systems. Here we have the, the more mobile, poorly developed plaza, which are often associated with large volumes, but low grade. Here we see the bedrock control river systems, which have deep pools and scour channels, where we have high grades, but low volumes. And in some places in the, in the DRC, these bedrock trap sites get recharged year after year. So it's great. You can sit at one site and mine the same deposit time and time again after the rains have been. If we look at the, the kinds of trap sites that we find in these river deposits, typically of two different varieties, we have the, the sedimentary mobile trap sites and then the fixed bedrock uh, trap sites. So if we look at the, the mobile sedimentary trap sites, these are associated with gravel bars. And the diamonds tend to, to concentrate either on the, the platform or the bar head in the upstream side of the, the bar. Down in the, the bedrock, we're looking at concentrations within scour pockets the upslopes of, of push bars. And while these deposits here in the sedimentary trap sites can be very commercial, grades in these bedrock trap sites may be two orders of magnitude higher than these up here. What this shows is it's important to know what your trap sites are and where to find them and know how to, to mix the, the material that comes from one or the other. Looking at this example in, in Angola, the, the Lulo alluvial diamond mine, we can see here that grade is not always the most important parameter in an alluvial diamond deposit. Lulo has a very low average grade around seven carats a hundred cube. But if we look at the, the average stone size of the deposit, 
and a 2020 average value of almost $2,000 a carat. This is one of the, the most lucrative deposits around, even at such low grades. Looking at the, the Congo River in the, the DRC, we get to see how important understanding your geomorphology is. Firstly, if we look within the, the bedrock trap sites, what we're finding here are high grades, but very little clay. Oh, so high grades and very little clay. But the problem here is that we've got low tonnage and the tonnage that we do have here doesn't really lend itself to mechanical mining. When we get down to the, the meander belt within the broad valley, here we've got sediment dominated trap sites. We've got large tonnages that lend themselves to mechanical mining. The downside is that the grades are iffy to low and there's often an abundance of clay which complicates the, the processing. The splay deposits, these two over here, this is where the river valley opens up and the gravels are dumped. These are generally high priority targets because you get reasonably large volumes and moderate grades. The reason that this splay here is such a low priority target is because there is abundant laterite in the gravels and this results in lower average grades and also increases problems with processing. When you look at alluvial deposits closer to source, your sedimentary overburden is thinner, but your alluvial deposits are immature, which brings its own problems of processing and also low diamond values. The further away from the source you get, the more mature the sediments are, making them easier to process and also getting higher diamond values. But the sedimentary overburden thicknesses increase to where your stripping ratios are prohibitive. Across on the, the other side of the DRC in the Chicope area, we take a look at two different gravel types. The first one is because the, the, uh, the travel gravels, these are a well-sorted gravel, and we can see the grades associated with, with that. These overlie the basal gravels, and what I want you to notice in this picture is how poorly sorted these gravels are. But look at the grades associated with that. So with respect to alluvial diamond deposits, poor sorting is actually good sorting. We don't really want our gravels to be well sorted. <clears throat> this is just a picture to blow your mind as to how an artisanal community can affect your prospect. This photograph here is at the end of the, the rainy season and the guys have identified a number of targets here in the, the bedrock. In just a few short weeks, after the river levels had subsided a little bit. This is the community of artisanals that had sprung up around it. What does that do to your resource estimation program? Moving across to the Central African Republic, we've got two areas of alluvial diamond deposition, the Central Bria area, and the, the Western Kano area. We have got both bedrock and sedimentary um, targets there. What's interesting to note about the, the Western um, alluvial deposit is that we've got a reasonably high proportion of carbonaro. Well, about 40% of the diamonds there are carbonaro. And this becomes very important or very interesting when we go across the, the border to Cameroon, because the diamond deposits on the eastern side of Cameroon also have a reasonably high proportion of carbonado, possibly implying a common source with the Central African Republic diamonds. 
This diamond deposit also highlights another interesting feature. Back in 2006, guys were very happily mining the quaternary alluvial deposits. And then they noticed that the, the bedrock, excuse me, was a proterozoic conglomerate. And someone suggested that these conglomerates might actually be the source of the alluvials and might represent a significant reservoir of diamonds, which was all in all a very plausible suggestion. So in 2010, the company that was mining there, CNK, they were listed on the Korea Stock Exchange and sold without doing a single sampling, sampling exercise. They declared a mineral reserve of 736 million carats. And a couple of years later, after they'd actually done some sampling and found zero diamonds in the basement samples, CNK was delisted from the exchange, project was abandoned, the directors all went to jail, but politics being politics, they were all out within six months, while the widows and orphans who had invested in the project lost their shirts. It's interesting to note that the Korea Stock Exchange does not have any requirements with respect to compliance with any international reporting codes like we have here with, with SAMREC. If they had have had compliance with reporting codes, this kind of scam would never have taken place. Okay, moving back to, to Zimbabwe to the Somabula deposits. Here we've got a two meter basal diamectite, which is a Permian till. The diamonds, as you can see, are, are pretty good quality with large average diamond size. Problem is the, the grades. And these are really sub-economic, especially when you think you've got an overburden of up to 40 meters. But what makes this deposit especially interesting is the, the heavy minerals that are associated with this deposit, a host of other gemstones and also various precious metals. Out near the Swaziland Mozambique border, the basal units of the Stormberg group represent a braided river stream environment. And they contain diamonds that have been identified as coming from the Dokoweo Kimberlite, some 30 kilometers away to the west. Lani was mined by Transhex in the, the late 70s, early 80s, to a depth of 170 meters and a long strike for one and a half kilometers. Moving on to West Africa. In Mali, we know of 29 Kimberlites in the southwestern portion of the, the country. Here they are in the, the red dots. According to the, the USGS survey, about eight of these are reportedly diamondiferous, but none of them are commercial. Alluvial diamonds are recovered as a byproduct in the alluvial gold deposits. But what's interesting is look at the size of these diamonds. 95% per, per weight of the diamonds recovered have been greater than 15 carats. A fair number of plus 50 carats and 232 is the, the largest stone known. Some really interesting stuff happening there. In Sierra Leone, the alluvial deposits exist primarily in the eastern half of the country, all of them sourced from the high grade dikes around Koidu and Tongo. The grades in the alluvial deposits here can be phenomenal, with the highest grade ever recorded in an alluvial deposit at over a thousand carats per ton, not per hundred ton. Sierra Leone also boasts some very large diamonds. These two over here, the, the star of Sierra Leone is the third largest diamond ever recovered and also the largest alluvial diamond known. 
In the, the northeast of, of Liberia, we get some small spotted diamonds recovered from the graphite schists in the Precambrian granite terrain stone terrain around Nimba. Again, these get reworked out of these deposits into the present river systems. And then further across in the, 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 uh, the west of, of uh, Liberia, we've got the, the truly alluvial deposits associated with the, the Mano River, the Lofa, the Wesua. Um, these are all, all derived, we assume, or derived from kimberlites such as the Proterozoic pipes at Wesua and the Mesozoic pipes at, at, at Mano and also up at Camp Alpha. They are assumed to be more of them in the area as well. And these ones here in the, the Camp Alpha area, these were the ones recently identified by Steve Haggerty using this plant here, the Pandanus candelabrum as an indicator. Wherever he found these plants growing, there were diamond difference, or there were, there were kimberlite ducts associated with them. These two deposits in Guinea highlight the effect that volume can have on the economics of an alluvial deposit. Out here at Mandela, we've got gravels preserved in bedrock trap sites. They've got reasonably high grades, we can see here, but relatively low volumes. Across at Aridor, we're looking at a very broad sluggish system on a soft substrate. And so we have much lower grades, but significantly higher tonnages. Those higher tonnages combined with larger stones means that while the grades here never made it past feasibility at Mandela. The Aridor mine was in commercial production from 1934 and only closed in 2008. The alluvial deposits of the, the Burum River in Aquatia have produced over 100 million carats in the 60 years from their discovery in 1919 to 1979. They were recovered from terraces, but mostly from the Burham River itself. In the early years, um, GCD, which is Ghana Consolidated, a joint venture between the Ghana government and Central African Selection Trust. These deposits were mined commercially and in the mid-70s, the mid they were producing two and a half million carats a year from a commercial diamond production. However, things went sideways in the early 80s. A combination of nationalism and gross mismanagement has meant that today, this is all you have here, is a few legal and illegal diggers trying to recover as many diamonds as they can. At the, the main Aquatia operation, the diamond size was around 30 stones per carat, extremely small. And then they still decreased downstream from there. The majority of the diamonds are industrial and gemstones over one carat are extremely rare. When looking at a source for these diamonds, we note that the, the bedrock there is the Barimian volcano sedimentary sequence. And within that, we see at least two coarse tough units within the Greywacky that we have seen containing diamonds, those sub-economic concentrations. Are these the primary source or just a secondary collector? Nobody knows just yet. Those are just some of the interesting alluvial deposits that we have in Africa. We've got a whole bunch more down here in Southern Africa that we definitely don't have the, the time to go into today. And I hope you've enjoyed this whirlwind tour through the alluvial deposits of Africa. And if anybody has any questions, I shall take.
Sorry, I think I was muted there. Thank you, Tanya. Um, are there questions or comments? I'm sure there should be some discussion. Please unmute your mic and fire away. Uh, Tanya, it's uh, Richard here. Thanks very much for that very interesting talk. A very good overview that you gave us. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, what I wanted to ask you, you mentioned the the green diamonds uh, that are found in some of these um, uh, earlier deposits like the bits and um, in Ghana, for example, and you attribute the color to that radiation from presumably uh, ur uraninite in the case of the bits, but I don't think there's any uraninite in the... Um, in the top coin, but I might be wrong on that one. Um, so I just wanted to know the source of those diamonds. You indicate the possibility of actinolite schist and graphitic schists. So what is the significance of that? And why do they contain the diamonds and not, um, you know, um, not kimberlitic material? So I'm, I'm just wondering about the origin of those early green diamonds. Um, part of the problem trying to define the origin of those diamonds there is that these deposits are not being actively mined today. So we're not being, being able to, to look at the diamonds and to analyze them with the knowledge that we have in the 21st century. We're looking at descriptions of, of diamonds from previous um, explorers. So that's the, the one side of it. The other side is that within those areas, there's been no discovery of, of proper Kimberlites. And so people are really uncertain as to where they come from. And so they're just looking at what types of ultramafic rocks are known in that area, which could potentially be source rocks to diamonds. Mm. Okay, thanks. So things like that actinolite schist might be pretty interesting, whatever that was. Yes. Okay. So it could be another variant of kimberlitic material, perhaps. Is that a possibility? That is the, the, the some of the thoughts that are going around, yes. Okay, good. No, thanks, Tanya. And thanks for that um, excellent talk. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions? Maybe just a query from me. Uh, Tanya, have you got any experience with the Brazilian situation where we have all kinds of rivers full of all kinds of diamonds and all kinds of kimberlites with no diamonds? That is a very interesting, very long convoluted uh, conversation. My personal opinion is that many of the, the, the diamonds may have come from uh, West Africa and have got caught up in, in Brazil as a secondary collector. But um, that, that's something we're going to have to discuss over a bottle of wine one day. That could take several bottles, I suspect. <laughs> yes. Any other comments or questions? Uh, Craig, maybe just one other comment uh, quickly. It's Richard here. Um, I think it's the Roraima group in um, Venezuela and, and Brazil that has a basal conglomerate with um, gold and diamond. So this association with gold and diamond in, in early conglomerates seems to be quite interesting. I'm not sure if you if you know anything about the Roraima um, diamond fields in Venezuela, uh, Tonya, Canaima area. Yeah, basically what you're looking at, at there, Richard, is um, there have been kimberlites which have come up through the through the Roraima or through a basal um, unit, and 
I'm, I'm dragging information out of the back of my memory. The chemolysis that came out hit a particular unit and spread out. And those got into the, the Rurima. What their relationship is with the gold, that I have absolutely no idea about. And then those, the, the Rurima itself has then been reworked into the, the younger alluvial deposit, which is where people are mining today. Okay, no thanks. So there are two types of um, deposits, the older conglomeratic ones, which are not mined then as I understand it, and then reworking of those, which gives rise to the present uh, alluvial workings. Yes. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Tanya, just um, thinking about it and looking at Proterozoic, rocks in particular, or some of the Proterozoic deposits, um, there doesn't seem to be much association uh, between diamond content and other precious stones, um, except in a few cases. Would you care to comment on that? Um, the, the only place we know where there is a, a relationship is um, Somabula in, in Zimbabwe. Elsewhere, no, because um, many of the other precious stones, the rubies and the, um, the sapphires, they typically found in the, um, the, the younger greenstone or coming out of the, the younger granite deposits. So there's, there's no real association with, with kimberlites at all. There is an association in Australia and some of the alluvials, particularly with sapphires. Yeah, I think that's possibly because you might be looking at um, more of, um, oh, my brain has gone to, to mush. Uh, more of an, uh, where the, the lamprawites there are, are less mafic, if I can put it in, in those terms. And so more associated with the, the granites where things are being eroded off and into the alluvial deposits. You'd know more about the, 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 the kimberlites there, Ingrid. Tanya, I'm, I'm thinking more in, in sort of um, southeastern Australia where the, the origin of the diamonds is, is really poorly under, understood. Um, the kind of area where, where Rondi Davies worked and where there was quite a lot of dredging in the early years also for gold. So again, Richard, there's that, that association with, with gold and, and diamonds there. So it's, it's also one of those mysteries where a number of quite exotic origins for the, the diamonds have been proposed um, and, and really nothing, nothing definitive. So again, very, very interesting. Mm, yeah, thanks. Tanya, maybe just one more question for me. Um, would you care to comment on the possible association of, of diamonds and dwika, the dwika tillite? I, that's been talked about at various occasions in the past, but I don't know what the current thinking is about that. Pass. I'm not getting into that discussion. <laughs> okay. Um, any more questions or comments before I close off? <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Hello, yes. Morris, hi. Yeah. hi, Morris. Uh, hi there. Thanks, Tanya, for the talk. Just a, a very quick one. Um, presumably, the, the source of the, the kimberlitic material in, on the African continent, all, all the kimberlites are in cratons. In other words, Clifford Rule. Does, does that apply to everyone you described? And then the secondly, uh, is there anything distinctive about the diamonds um, that occur in these different cratons or uh, that are derived from kimberlites in, in the different cratons of Africa? Well, I'm just going to, to comment on the, the alluvial side is that while the kimberlites themselves may be derived from the, um, from the cratons, 
we find alluvial deposits on cratons, we find them on craton margins, we find them in the, in the sea. So the, the diamonds are very mobile. And um, with respect to the, the differences of diamonds from kimberlites in different parts of the, the craton, um, that, that, that's a bit beyond my wheelhouse. There are lots of people here who can answer that one better. Would anybody yeah. like to comment? I think, you know, even even in an individual pipe like um, like the Cullen or, or, or Premier Kimberlite, there's a, a huge difference in SFD and, and diamond characteristics between the, the two main groups of, of Kimberlite, whether it's the um, brown or the, um, the piebald and the dark and the black Kimberlites, which were, you know, what you look at a more sort of hyperbyssal um, and, and more of a um, volcanoclastic kimberlite. So to, to look at differences in alluvials between cratons, you can, and, and you have multiple populations even within one kimberlite and within one kimberlite facies. So there is a lot of complexity that, that keeps several of us employed gainfully. With that, thank you, Ingrid. Um, uh, one last chance for a comment or question. Going once, going twice, going three times. Tanya, with that, um, I thank you very much. We are recording this and it will be available for reviewing on the, US, on the GSSA YouTube channel uh, probably early next week. Thank you for the talk. Um, uh, everybody, thank you for joining in and I hope you have a good weekend. Uh, keep Keep your ears tuned for more of these lunchtime lectures in the future. We're probably going to continue with this series uh, every Friday. So with that, thank you from the Geological Society. Um, I'll keep the meeting open for a little bit in case there's any more comments, but I'll stop recording. Thank you very much, Tanya. Thank you. Thank you.